Today is Thursday, April 8th at 7 o'clock in the library activity room of Flint Memorial Library. We have Harold Parker State Forest discover a hidden gem right next door. Bob Anderson, park interpreter, will talk about the history and the offerings of this wonderful neighboring resource, which has graced our town for many years and created a friends group. No, no. Hello. Pleased to have all you folks here today. My name is Jean Osborne. I'm president of the Friends of the Library, and um, I'd like to give you a, uh, two seconds of what uh, some other programs that are coming up. I have to put on my specs to see them. Uh, we have a um, how to money, how to manage your money between jobs. That's at the uh, networking job networking group on Tuesday. We have a genealogy roundtable coming up next week, led by Diane Dow from the library on Tuesday the 20th. That's a, is that a noon time? Event? Four o'clock, I think. That's a three o'clock event. Three o'clock, I'm sorry, it's a three o'clock event. And then we have, a week later, we have introduction to genealogy records at the Mass State Archives, and that's a Tuesday evening event the following Tuesday evening on April 27th. We also, on Sunday, the 25th, we have a concert presented by Jonathan Miller, who's a cellist from the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and Michael Feingold, who's playing flute. And that will be the last program for the uh, related to the North Reading Reads. We also have a Reiki program, Holistic Reiki, Gentle Healing for People and Pets, on May 8th. We have a digital photography pro workshop, Thursday, May 13th. And we have, for the Friends Annual Meeting, we have a marimba playing, a marimba player, easy for me to say. <laughs> um, he's from Mito Nuyoya. I'm probably not saying his name correctly, but he is a world, uh, world known marimba player. So if any of you are musically interested, you should really come and encourage your musical friends to come. That will be quite an event on Monday, June 14th. And then we also, last but not least, our major fundraiser is the Spring Book Sale, which is May 20th, 21st, and 22nd here in the library. Um, just so you know, so you may have seen the article about our new partnership with Big Hearted Books. You'll see the big bin out in the back corner of the library. The, book, the books that you put in there are book sale books. They will come back to us for our book sale. So don't feel like you're giving them to somebody else. They're going to be kind of books is carting them away. They're going to sort them and put them on nice racks for us. And then they're going to bring them back to us to sell to you folks. So we encourage you to bring us your books. You can either, again, you can bring them to the front desk or better yet, put them in the bin. But we really would appreciate your, your donations for the book sale. We'll have a preview night for friends only where we'll have a few refreshments and uh, you get first dibs on the books. And then uh, the next two nights will be open to the public. So. Again, we encourage you to come. We're very glad to see you all here for Harold Parker because that truly is a gem, a gem in, in our midst. And we have two nice, very nice people from Harold Parker, <laughs> Bob Anderson and Barbara Bolts. Yeah. And I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Can Thank I just interrupt? I, the, uh, the, the Historical Society, this is also sort of a joint meeting, though we don't have enough people from the membership to actually do anything. So as I say, Thank you, society members that did come, and thank you for everybody else coming. And now I leave and, it to and you. That's true, and I'm I'm totally remiss in not thanking the historical society for being a joint sponsor of this program. And I I apologize. Oh, that's okay. There's so many lists of things here to do. Okay. But, um, but we appreciate their support as well. They provide a lot of the refreshments and the nice flowers, and um, and so we're glad to have their support as well. Okay. So thank you. Thank you. Want, want thank, you. thank you for having us. Um, I'm Bob Anderson, the park interpreter at Harold Parker State Forest, and this is Barbara Bull. She's the regional, northeast regional interpretive coordinator for this district, and uh, my boss. And, uh, and we're you know lucky that we have her here tonight. But what we're going to do is uh, start the program with a little talk about Harold Parker and the history of Harold Parker, and uh, go through any questions. If anyone has any questions, we'll kind of keep this informal. Um, you can ask me as I go along and stuff, talking about the history. 
and what's available to the public there. And then we'll go through a slideshow uh, presentation of the CCC program, which is the Civilian Conservation Corps, and, and their history and uh, how they formed the, the state parks in, in this state. And, and we have, you know, like Harold Parker is a direct result of the work that they did over there. We had two camps over there. So we'll get into all of that. But um, in any case, I'll start with the history of Harold Parker. And Harold Parker, as you know, borders North Reading and also Middleton, North Andover, and Andover. And it comprises of about 3,500 acres. And um, it lies about 20 miles north of Boston, which we know. And uh, its history is notable, and its current uses are extensive, and its continued preservation essential. The history reveals that what is now Essex County was occupied by the native people more than 9,000 years ago. And this was the Pentecosts who inhabited the area. And the artifacts have been, been, been discovered in Harold Parker State Forest, with at least two archaeological sites. Uh, the women of the tribe harvested crops consisting of a variety of squashes, beans, and corn, while hunting was the male occupation. This continued until a terrific mortality occurred as a result of a mysterious plague that was introduced by the Europeans, traders in 1615 and 1616. This decreased the native population from Cape Ann to Cape Cod from approximately 100,000 to just over 5,000. Though there was interaction and extensive trade between the Europeans and the natives, adult Europeans never contracted this deadly plague. It was at this time that European farmers began to settle in Massachusetts. In 1646, John Woodridge purchased Andover from Custamachi for $30 and an old coat. Can you imagine? Wow. And as the European population grew, the lands were cleared by the early settlers for predominantly agricultural use. It's important to note that in 1758, the Jenkins family of Malden purchased a 400-acre parcel in Andover, which abuts, abuts what, what is now forest property. And he purchased that from Peter Osgood. In 1765, Samuel Jenkins erected a house on the property, which still stands today. Samuel Jenkins' grandson, a prominent landowner, William Jenkins, from he, was, he lived from 1796 to 1878, and his wife Mary Farnham, who lived until 1891, were staunch abolitionists. And they used this house as a station on the Underground Railroad. And since the farm was prominently located on the Boston Haverhill Turnpike, Route 114, they, uh, they, uh, they used this. This became an important stop for the slaves that were escaping from the south to Canada, for freedom in Canada. And the, the escapees, the, the slaves there, were hidden under the loose floorboards in the attic and also inside the fireplace. And frequent visitors to this house included such important figures as noted abolitionist and philanthropist William Lloyd Garrison and the American Negro reformer and diplomat Frederick Douglass, and also the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin, Harriet Beecher Stowe. This continued until about 1863 to 1864 when the Emancipation Proclamation was passed and the fugitive slave law was annulled. The soapstone builder mocking William Jenkins' grave at the Spring Grove Cemetery in Andover reads, he lived to see the fulfillment of his great desire, the abolition of slavery in America. Well, his house is... is that yeah. the house that said Salem and Jenkins? Or is it? Uh, that house, I don't know if I should tell you where that house is. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, near the, it's near the... The corner of Salem and Jenkins. It used to have its own driveway, but now it's off one of those yeah, new subdivisions. Oh, yeah. okay, that one. Yeah. yeah. The oh, Jenkins yeah. house. Because yeah. it's, oh, yeah, yeah. it's a private home today, yeah, so right, right, yeah. uh, direct people to the private home. So, but they actually, um, the, the descendants of the Jenkins, and I'm, I'm forgetting their name is slipping from me right now. It starts with a P. Um, Pettigrew, is that their name? Yeah. They, 
that's who is currently inhabiting the house, oh, as far as I know. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and and this house is still occupied. And it's located on the west side of Jacob's Road. I'll give you that much. <laughs> <laughs> And during this period and into the early 20th century, much of the farmland that was abandoned due to movement west, you know, the farmers were moving out west in search of better agricultural soil, farming gave way to the manufacturing of textile, <coughs> uh, paper, shoes, wood products in the region. And William, and in 1836, William Jenkins entered into a 14-year agreement with this guy Addison Flint and he and the stone cutter uh, Michael Fl Flannery. 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 That's, an, that's an interesting. I thought it was like Flannery or something. It's Flannery. And anyways, to the blue to uh, quarry blue soapstone from this Jenkins property, and uh, on the west side of Jenkins Road, which is now part of Harrow Park State Forest. Yeah. And uh, that's part of an interpretive program that we do at Harrow. And uh, the, the uses for the soapstone were like window moldings, um, the uh, monuments in Mount Auburn Cemetery, soapstone sinks. Um, there was there was a lot of different uses that they they could carve this stone. It was a soft stone, and they could carve it very easily. So it became uh, it became very useful, and the quarry was profitable until after about ten years in operation. The treasurer absconded with the funds, and uh, it no longer was profitable. <laughs> <laughs> so it discontinued at that time. So it's too bad. This is still in the They're like half finished, you know, and they're really beautiful. But uh, in any case, you'd have to go on an interpretive program to see that. So but, uh, we do that every week over there. Um, so a stone's throw from the quarry is also another historical significant site which is the uh, the old mill, the sawmill of the Scud River. And uh, they, that was used also to cut the stone, because the stone was a soft stone, and they could cut that with the saw blade. Um, so they used it not only for the wood, but also to cut the, the, the uh, soapstone. Um, that, the foundations of that mill are still there today. On the, and, uh, and by the way, Swift, uh, the Scug River, that means, uh, I'm told, that was an Indian name for the Pentecook Pen Indians that meant Swift. That river was a very <laughs> swift river, so it could drive that wheel, you know, to, to turn the uh, stock for the mill. Um, but in any case, that's, that river is still flowing pretty good, except for the, there's some beaver dams there that are kind of holding it back a little bit. But, uh, it's, a, it's a nice take over there. It's a really beautiful spot. Um, so, and then just up the way from the other, there's also, um, which is not too far up the, up the trail, there's also a glacial erratic. I'm sure many of you that have been visited that part of the forest have seen that huge boulder that looks so out of place. I mean, it's just, you know, where did this thing come from? But, you know, probably Canada. A thousand years ago, that's where it was brought down from, or someplace. But uh, it, you know, twelve thousand years ago, I guess they say now, eleven between eleven and twelve thousand years ago, there was a mile high of ice here. This was just the, it was just all ice. You know, there was nothing here. And those Indians, the Penacook Indians, once that ice receded, and uh, you know, that's when the Penacook Indians came. It was about 9,000 years ago they found artifacts dating back to that. So they've been here ever since then. And there's still some people that, uh, you know, the descendants of that tribe, not too many, but there are still some. 